فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to start the kitab الفرائد البهية في نظم القواعد الفقهية written by أبو بكر Al-Ahdal Rahimahullah Ta'ala We'll be speaking about the book and matters pertaining to it inshallah ta'ala next lesson For today lakin inshallah ta'ala we're going to be speaking about um, Qawaid al-Fiqiyah And the way we're going to be speaking about it is the definition of Al-Qawaid al-Fiqiyah number one Today we're going to be speaking about Al-Qawaid al-Fiqiyah what is its definition what does it mean We'll also be speaking about the stages, maratib al qawaid al fiqiyah, the types and the stages of al qawaid al fiqiyah. We'll also be touching on what's the difference between al qaida and al dabit. We'll also be speaking about nash'ah wa tadween, ilm al qawaid al fiqiyah, when qawaid al fiqiyah started. And we'll also be speaking about how it was written and how it was made into a subject that is studied. Also, inshallah ta'ala, I will be speaking about ahammu al-mu'allafat fi al-qawaid al-fiqiyya, the well-known, the most common books from the books of qawaid al-fiqiyya and I'm going to be mentioning each and every one of them in accordance to the madhabs that are out there. So the madhab al-Hanafiyya, the books that are written in it, madhab al-Malikiyya, the qawaid books that they have and they have written, Shafi'iyya and the Hanabila. Also, I will be speaking about istimdad al-qawaid al-fiqiyya. Where is qawaid al-fiqiyya rooted from? Where is? Qawaid al fiqhiyya rooted from. And where is it taken it Where was it taken from? Where, what's the source of Qawaid al fiqhiyya? The masadir of Qawaid al fiqhiyya. Last but not least, inshallah ta'ala, I will be speaking about Fawaid, the benefits of Dirasatul Qawaid al fiqhiyya. The benefits of studying Qawaid al fiqhiyya. Um, and these are some of the Mabadi al Ashara. In that line of poetry, he does say what? Al-Ba'du uh, bil-Ba'du iktafa wa man dara al-jami'a haza al-sharafa That some of them can suffice you from knowing the rest. Al-Ba'du bil-Ba'du iktafa If you know some of the, the Mabadi al-Ashara, you don't know all of them of that subject. You just know some, they suffice you from it. But then he goes on to say, wa man dara al-jami'a haza al-sharafa But if you know all of the ten, it makes you pass and go deep into, into honor. But so inshallah ta'ala, we may not have a lot of time to go through each of the ashara, the ten of the mabadi al ashara regarding qawaid al fiqiyya but these are the, the most important ones. The first one inshallah ta'ala is ta'rif al qawaid al fiqiyya Defining qawaid al fiqiyya To define Al-Qawaid Al-Fiqhiyya Brothers and sisters who are listening Qawaid Al-Fiqhiyya is a compounded, it's a compounded word It's a compounded, it's a compounded word Meaning, it consists of two words put together Qawaid and Al-Fiqhiyya Qawaid and Al-Fiqhiyya So what we're going to do inshallah ta'ala is We're going to define them Individually, we're going to define what qaida means, and then we're going to define what fiqh means linguistically and technically. Each, so we're going to define qaida linguistically and technically. We'll also define fiqh linguistically and technically. We'll do that. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Then, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to define the two of the compounded, the two words that, are, that have come together, qawaid al fiqiyah together now. We're going to define it, what it means. Is that crystal clear? So we're first going to do it, what? Qa'idah. I'm a qawaid, what it means, and then we're going to do what fiqh means. Lughat al mustilaha lughat al mustilaha each, linguistically, technically, linguistically, and technically. And then what we're going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is we're going to bring both of the words together, qawaid and al fiqiyah and we're going to define what it means, inshallah ta'ala. And brothers, you all need to know and understand the importance of comprehending things, definitions and words. ولذلك الحكم على شيء فرع عن تصوره. The fuqaha they say, and the usulin they say, that to place a ruling on something, there first has to be a correct perception. الحكم على شيء. A ruling on a matter can only come from you after there is what? Correct perception. That you've perceived this word and the thing properly. An example will clarify the matter. Are you with me, brothers? With an example, it becomes clear. For example, somebody comes up to you and says to you the word ta'meen. Ta'meen is what? The ta'meen is insurance. The con this contemporary time that we exist is called insurance. So you go to an individual and you say to him, Ma hukmu istikhdamu ta'meen. What is the ruling in using a ta'meen? And he goes to you, Imam al Nawawi rahimahullah said, using, I'm doing a ta'meen is wajib bittifaq al fuqaha. It is wajib in accordance to what the jurists said. It's obligatory. And he said, Where did Imam al Nawawi say this? And so he brings you the statement of Imam al Nawawi, and you realize that the ta'meen he's talking about is the amin in the salah. You realized. That he's talking about the Ameen in the Salah, and you were talking about the insurance. Are you with me, brothers? So, if the person does not know the wordings like that, they don't know the istilahat, the terms, and they don't have the correct definition with them, a lot of the times khalal comes, deficiency comes. Are you with me? Deficiency comes. And that deficiency becomes a problem according, it becomes a problem for your ruling that comes out. The definition and the perception of the word has now caused a harm to what? To your ruling. Because now he's saying it's wajibun, wajibun what? It is obligatory according to the, the fuqaha. And this issue of insurance is, a, <coughs> is something else different to the word at Are you with me brothers? So that's why it is very, very important that a person learns the ta'arif. The definitions. What does this word mean? Okay, what does this word mean? Also, another thing that you need to understand, which is that the first point was that the importance of learning the de definitions. The second thing you need to remember is the definitions differ from one field to another field. In one field, the word may mean something, and in another field, it may mean something different to the other field. Are you with me? So if you do khalt and you mix the two, like for example the word us asal, according to the usuleen it has a meaning, and according to the sarfiyin, the people of sarf, morphology, they consider usul something different. For them it's something, something different from that which it is. Can anyone else give us another example of what something is in one place? For example the word sahih for instance, for the scholars of hadith it means something, and from the, the scholars of Sarf, what does the word Sahih mean? When they say this word is word Sahih, there's no huruf illa in it. There's no, there's no wow or alif or ya in it. Sahih? Correct? So the one grammarians or the Sarfiyin, they say this word is Sahih. It means it doesn't have wow in it, it doesn't have alif in it, and it doesn't have ya in it, meaning it's not a sick letter. So they mean it has all the other alphabets in it. it there's none of those three words. But then when the scholars of, uh, um, scholars of hadith say this is sahih, what do they mean by it? Do they mean there's no wow alif or ya in it? They mean it's hadith sahih, sah? مَتَّصَلَ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يُشَدَّ أَوْ يُعَنْ يَرْوِيهِ عَدْلٌ ضَابِطٌ عَمْ مِثْلِهِ مُعْتَمَدٌ فِي طَبْطِهِ وَنَقْلِهِ The chain of narration is correctly connected. 
the five conditions that we speak about in the hadith are met basically. So you realize that, hey, can anyone else give us an example of a word that is different from one field to another field? Sunnah, for instance. For example, scholars who deal with Qutb Aqaid, when they use the word Sunnah, Sharh Sunnah, they are referring to what? They are referring to the fundamentals of the religion. Sahih. When the Fuqaha use the word Sunnah, what do they sometimes mean by it? Or what do they mean by it? They mean by the opposite of The opposite of wajib. This is Sunnah meaning it is not. It is not wajib. So you realize, if you think, for example, the problem that can occur, if you think to yourself that Sunnah means that which is opposite to obligation. The Sunnah is, for you, this is the only definition you have of the word Sunnah. You only think Sunnah means anything that is opposite to wajib. It's a Sunnah. Does that make sense? A problem will occur later. You'll start to say, um, if somebody comes up to you and says, the bid is a Sunnah, you'll be like, oh, okay, it's not wajib. Whereas here, Sunnah means what? The way of the Prophet. Everything he said and did is what? And that which he consented to is a Sunnah. So when the Prophet said in the hadith of Irbad ibn Sariya, Alaykum, upon you is my Sunnah, did he mean that which is not obligatory? Does that make sense? So it is important. Another issue that you realize is that the word, for example, Karaha, Makru. The word Makru. The word Makru is what? According to who? To the Mutqaddimin as well. The early generation, the word Karaha was what? Haram. Why would they use the word Karaha for? Like, the word Karaha means disliked. But why would they use that word? Why don't they just use the word Haram? The reason why they did not like to use it, the Salaf of Hadi Al-Ummah, the righteous, pious predecessors, was because they had wara. They didn't like this con- you know, unwavering decision to just say Haram like that. They were very pious. So they would use a lighter term. But they refer to something which is haram. And they, would, they meant it from the angle of Allah saying, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُ أَلْسِرَتُكُمُ الْكَذِبَ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ So they didn't want to hasten to say haram, halal, haram, halal. So they used a the term which was karaha, disliked. But you sometimes see things that are mujma'un alayhi, that are unanimously agreed upon, they would use the word. وَلِذَلْكِ بْنُ الْقَيِّمِ مِنِ الْكِتَاب he expands on that. So what I'm saying to you brothers is that definitions are very important that you understand it properly. Find an example that I want to give, which you tend to find, it's, an, it's another example, is this concept of people saying لا إنكار في مسائل الخلاف لا إنكار في مسائل الخلاف There is no inkar, meaning I, you can't reject, you can't oppose me, you can't rebuke me. Okay? For matters which are difference of opinion. Are you with me, brothers? So they used it, I, and I want you to ponder here with me because it's very important. And this is something that became common on the people's tongues. And inshallah, later when we speak about qawa'id al fiqiyah, the benefits that are in qawa'id al fiqiyah, and usul al fiqh, one of the things that you benefit most from them is how to realize, or how to speak. You'll be very diligent and very careful in the usage of the words is that you use. You'll be a person who's muhtaris, a person who safeguards and gets rid of everything that could be thought of him. Like, his words are very clear. This is what qawa'id al-fiqiyya and usul al-fiqh teach people. That's the benefits that we're going to be speaking about here. But here, the reason why I'm bringing it here is because knowing definitions is very important. Look at it here. La inkara. Do not, exp- do not scold me. Do not rebuke me. For what? في مسائل الخلاف matters which are difference of opinion. This is wrong. Because khilaf means, that if you knew the definition of khilaf, you would not have said this. Khilaf means, I mean, what falls under khilaf is what? A person has an evidence and another person doesn't have an evidence. One has قال الله and قال الرسول. Allah and his messenger said. This, un- other, this person on the other side doesn't have that. يُنْكَرْ عَلِي He will be refuted for it. Or he would be rejected on it. Or he'll be scolded for it. Or he'll be rebuked for it. Because we have qala Allah and qala Rasul and you don't have it. So in this, it becomes what? Inkar. Inkar occurs. Um, but what those people should say, if they knew the definition properly, was what? 
لا إنكار في مسائل الاجتهاد لا إنكار في مسائل الاجتهاد There's no inkar in what? In issues which have ijtihad involved in it. Are you with me, brothers? Why? What's the difference between khilaf and ijtihad? You see, this is where the issue here which comes, which is al-furuq wa taqasim, knowing the differences of issues. And this is why we study al-ashbah wa nadair. This is why later. It's knowing which the definition, why this one is this and this is this, so you know the difference. Ijtihad means both of these people are standing over evidences. They've both encountered each other's evidence. They've seen each other's evidence. I know what evidence you're using. You know what evidences I'm using. We're aware of each other's evidence. No one is dismissing anyone's evidences. But the problem with me and you is we're differing on what this means. You and I, our issue is, what does it mean? Like for example, the hadith of placing your knees down or your hands down. The issue is, well, how does the camel go down? For example, some would say to you, this is the argument of those who say, <coughs> for example, the camel goes down on what first? Based on you, you would say he goes down on his knees first. And because if you look at the camel, you will realize that the camel folds its front two, just like we, fo we fold our legs. And the last two are look at like the arms. You see, the arms go in and the knees come out. The camel's two back, they go out like they did, exactly like our arms, they go backwards like this. And the front two go like the knees. So the front are the knees and the, 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 the other two are what? The hands of the camel. It, or it takes the ruling of the hands. Somebody would say to you, I don't even, I'm not speaking about that. I'm talking about the hater, the form it goes down. He goes on the first part of it goes down first. The first part of his body goes down and you go, you go down on your first part of your body. Are you with me, brothers? So here the khilaf is the part he goes down and the form he goes down on. This is the discussion that is happening. So this is the same hadith, but everyone is extracting it. And if somebody's weakening one other person, you're weakening my narration. I'm, no, I'm strengthening my narration and weakening yours, and you're weakening mine and strengthening your own. This is the This is jihad. La in karafi. We love. There's no problem. We can have a discussion about it. But it is a khilaf musawwaq, a khilaf sa'ir. Are you with me? So this is why the scholars, they say, لا إنكار في مسائل الاجتهاد And they don't, they, they don't say, أما, one should not say, لا إنكار في مسائل الخلاف. Are you with me? لأن the rafidhi, he's got a khilaf with you. The mu'tazili, he has a khilaf with you. The khariji has a khilaf with you. So you're going to say, لا إنكار في مسائل الخلاف. Are you with me? No, it's مسائل الاجتهاد. And this issue occurs from al-jahlu, ignorance of the ta'arif, the definitions. And not knowing what each word means. And not comprehending it first. Because now if you say, لا إنكار في مسائل الخلاف, the hukum that comes from what the word you used is going to be a problem. صح? The implication of it is a problem now. Now some may say, أخي, didn't the scholars they did not scholars not say huh? did the scholars not say la mushahata fil istilah la mushahata fil istilah meaning there really isn't don't don't get stressed out too much and panic over definitions we can differ on definitions not not a problem la mushahata there's no problem with differences of definition when the scholars they said la mushahata fil istilah they are referring to what if the differencing of the definition has no khilaf, if there is no differences that are going to differences that are going to cause tawad, are you with me? Then it becomes la mushahata fil istilah. Meaning, if the your definition is going to go to a ruling which is incorrect, then this is a problem now. But if you are, for instance, defining it, and I'm defining it, but we're not really dif we're not differing. Then لا مشاحت في الاصطلاح لا مشاحت في الاصطلاح Are you with me? The usko I can talk about the ta'arif for very long but to summarize it the ulama ul mantiq the scholars who deal with ilm ul mantiq they call it the mantiqiyin صح? 
They say that the definition of a word has to what, brothers? It has to have two things. Sah? To define something, you have to. It has to be jami' and it has to be mani'. Jami'u mani'. Jami'u mani' means what? It's comprehensive. When they say comprehensive, it means the thing that you're trying to define has to fully be mentioned in there. Are you with me? <coughs> You can't partially bring it into the definition. It has to fully be brought into the definition. The second thing they say, it has to be mania, meaning it has to prohibit and it has to prevent any other thing entering into the definition. If I'm trying to define a phone, a mobile phone, my definition of a mobile phone should get rid of the definition of a, a telephone. She got rid of it. It should not fall into the definition. If I say, for instance, a mobile phone is a form of communication that two people are communicating. Khalas, I left it like that. That's, there's no difference between a Facebook account, an Instagram, uh, a mobile phone, a telephone, everything. My definition now is not comprehensive. And of course, it's not, it's, it's, it is not mani as well. So they say those two things have to be done. It has to be comprehensive and it has to be what? It has to be mani. Mani meaning it has to get rid of. You have to get rid of two things that Montaqeen they say it also has to be get rid. It has to be not mentioned in the definition as well. They say two things have to be found, and they say two things have to be absent as well. In anything you define, the first one was what? From the two that have to be found. What were the two I just mentioned now? It has to be jami, mean comprehensive, and it has to be what? Man. Also, from the definition, there has to be what? Two things that shouldn't come into your definition. The two things that should not come into your definition is the thing that you're defining, the thing that you're defining, any of its root words should not even be in your definition. So for example, you want to define what knowledge? Not in any way should the ayn, alif, lam, letter come into your definition, that root word, ilm. So you can't say, al-ilmu, uh, the definition of knowledge is, and ya'lam al insanu. That's a problem. You're defining ilm and you brought the word ya'lamu. How can that work? Are you with me? So you can't bring in the definition the word that you're defining, any of its any of its letters should not come into, ha, into that definition. When I say any of its letters, I don't mean that no ayn or lam can be or, or meme can't be in the whole definition. It can be as long as it's another word. But anything to do with that word, if it comes into the definition, they say your definitions are problematic now. Because what comes from it? Dawran, they call it. And Dawran means you're going in circles again. Because I'm going to again ask you, what does this word mean? And they're going to define it with what? And it keeps going, we're going in circles. Sah? The second thing that shouldn't come into the definition is you shouldn't bring in it thamaratuhu, the, the fruits that come out of that knowledge. So you can't define something with its fruits. Or in other words, it's fawaid that come out of it. You're trying to define, for example, qawaid uh, al-fiqiyya. You can't, for example, say to me that qawaid al-fiqiyya, you define it and then you say, لِتَعْرِفَ أَحْكَامَ الدِّينِ So you can know the rulers of the religion. And in your definition, which here I'm going to show you that it's happened. That you can't define qawaid al-fiqiyya by saying it is a science that you study this is, as you go along and then you say to know the rulings of the religion. To know the rulings of the religion is a fa'idah benefit of it that you take from it. It's a thamarah, a fruit that I get from it. But you haven't told me the haqiqah, the reality of it. And the definition should be more of a, the reality, not the, not the fa'idah. Are you with me brothers? And the reason why I'm taking too, so long on just the, the importance and the idea of ta'rif is because a lot of the times, and I've said this many times before, the day, today that we're living here, our day and age, the, the arguments and the disputations and the problems that people face, a lot of the times it is terms are used. صح? Terms are, are used. What do you define this term as? And what do you deter, deter? So it's important. Ta'rif. Define it. Ta'rif. So now, inshallah ta'ala, let's go into 
تعريف القواعد الفقهية. So the definition of قاعدة linguistically is what? It's جمع قاعدة. It's the plural of the word قاعدة. The singular is قاعدة and the plural is قواعد and this is called what? What type of جمع is this? جمع التكسير. The broken plural. والقاعدة في اللغة قاعدة in the linguistic meaning is هي أساس الشيء it is the foundation of something. The foundation is called قاعده. The foundation of this house is called قاعده. The word قاعده is what? Linguistically, the foundation. The قاعده linguistically it is categorized into two. When you hear the word قاعده linguistically, تطلق القاعده ويراد بها the قاعده is said and it's, it's used and what is intended by it is one of two. One of these two. One is قواعد which are حسية, tangible, tangible foundations. Tangible foundations. I mean, principles. Tangible ones. And that is like قواعد البنيان والبيوت. Like the houses. The foundation of the house. And that is why Allah said in the Quran in Surah سورة البقرة الله تبارك وتعالى هي سيد وإذ يرفع إبراهيم القواعد من البيت وإسماعيل ربنا تقبل منا إنك إنك أنت السميع العليم وإذ يرفع إبراهيم والإبراهيم مزلفت القواعد القواعد أبوات من البيت الكعبة والإسماعيل والإسماعيل was also lifting it with his father Ibrahim so the قواعد here is what is what? It is tangible. It is the foundations of the Kaaba in which they are what? In which they are building. The second type is Qawaid Ma'nawiya. The Qawaid which are not tangible. They are not tangible. And that is like the Qawaid al Fiqh that we're talking about right now. For example, La Dharara wa La Dirar. Al Umuru bi Maqasidiha. You can't put your finger on the word You can't see it. Can you? You can't. And also the قواعد النحو the, the, the rulings and the principles in grammar are also قواعد قواعد الأصولية الأمر الأمر تقتضي الوجوب ما لم يأتي قليل تصرف عن الوجوب إلى الندبي This قاعدة right? أصولية Are you with me? The قاعدة from the نحويين which is what? الفاعل مرفوع قاعدة according to them المبتدأ مرفوع مبتدأ is what? قاعدة ده قاعدة نحوية it's a قاعدة for the grammarians can you touch can you, if I said to you touch it for me can you touch it it's not something tangible إذن the قواعد of two, two, those two types linguistically you with me? now let's talk about fiqh let's talk about fiqh what does fiqh linguistically mean? الفقه في اللغة فق linguistically means هو الفهم الدقيق. This is the a lot of the times brothers and of course sisters who are listening. A lot of the times what you see is people define فق with فهم and they just leave it like that. They'll say to you الفقه في اللغة الفهم and that's it. When in reality it is not. فق is a more is more detailed. It is having a deeper level of understanding. It's just not just. It's not just about understanding. It's more deeper. Are you with me? Al fiqh, fiqh is in the language is what al fahmu al daqiq. It is the faham which is detailed. The faham, the understanding which is detailed. This person's understanding is as though he specialized in this. Are you with me? And that is like مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا Anyone who Allah wants to wants for him good. مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا Anyone who Allah wants good for him. What does he do? What does he do to him? يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Allah gives him understanding of the religion. Are you with me? So now you might ask yourself, okay, يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Allah will give him understanding of the religion. What does it mean? It means, fiqh, if, 
may yurid Allah bihi khairan yufaqihu fi din if Allah would, if the prophet was to say yufahimhu ad din Allah would make him understand the religion it would have meant he would just know the hukum shar'i the jurisprudential rulings the ahkam which are the the, the, the nusus which are zahira he knows the ruling halal haram juz yajuz la yajuz like since the prophet sallam said yufaqihu fi din he doesn't just know the hukum, but he knows the ilal, the reasons. Are you with me? He's understanding he's more now. He knows the reasoning behind why Allah said it's halal and haram. Isn't that a next level now? It's a more detailed level than just knowing it's halal or haram. You actually have understanding of the ma'khad al-hukum, where the ruling was taken from. You know where would you call it, uh, the reasoning behind it, the ilal. And etc. Are you with me, brothers? That is fiqh. And of course, la shakka wa la raib, it is aqaid matters as well. It is and issues other than that. I mean, it's the whole religion. Faqihu fi deen is not just the, the fiqh that the istilahi that people know today. It's more of the whole religion. But it means that the person has detailed understanding of the religion. That is a sign of what, my brothers? Man yuri dilabi khayran. When you have the understanding of knowing the ilal, the reasonings behind things, and you have the understanding, it is a sign for you to know Allah from high above has wanted good for you. Allah has wanted for you. Allah wanted good for you. With that, al Allama Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, rahimahullah, in his kitab al Khushu' fi Salah, the humility in the prayer, you will find it if you look at it, it's translated in English for you as well. He says, Al Ilm Ilman. The knowledge is how many? Two types. Ilmu lisari, the knowledge of the? It's on the tongue. And the knowledge which is in the? The knowledge of the tongue, majority of the people, they share that together. Are you with me? But the knowledge that Allah is referring to in the ayah, إِنَّ مَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ Is what? Ilmu al-qalb. It is not ala... It is not ala falatati lisali, it's not just on the tongue of the person, it's just utterance of it. But rather it is something that has gone deep into the person's what? It has gone deep into the person's heart. This is something he is what? It's become like nature for him. He lives by these principles. I ask Allah wa ta'ala, he makes us from those. This is called what? It is, al -il. this is the fiqh and the understanding that is more, that's more detailed. Now that we've defined fiqh lugatan, what do we have to define it as what? Istilahan, technically. The technical definition of it. The technical definition of it is ma'rifatul ahkam al-shar'iyya. It is to know. So let's define each one word for word, okay? Ma'rifa. Ma'rifa, my brother, is what? Tashmalul ilma wa dhal. Ma'rifa, it means you have knowledge of, of something, and it also means if there is speculation as well, if there is dhan, if there is what? High speculation. That is ma'rifah. So fiqh is not just built upon what technically? Technically, look at it here. Fiqh is not, fiqh is not, it is the, the knowing of it is not what? It, it is not ilmi, I mean it's not yaqini, it's not certainty, all of them. There's dhanni involved. So there, that's why they say there is ilm and there is what? And there is dhan. Some things are qat'i, clear cut. Kawujubi salawat al khams. Like the five daily prayers, dhuhr, asr. And I started with dhuhr because that was the first prayer that was shown to, shown to the Prophet. Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and then Fajr. These five daily prayers are wajib. This is yaqeen, this is certainty, there is no doubt in anyone's heart. Sah? But there is what? There, are, there is, for example, if the prayer which is Salatul Qusuf, the eclipse, is it wajib or is it not? Dhani. It's not qat'i, it's not clear cut. So then the fiqh is what? Ma'rifatul ma'rifah, knowing either by ilm, which is qat'i, clear cut, or knowing it by dhani, which is what? Pull and push on it. Meaning there's khilafat revolving around it. There's what? Khilaf. There's dispute in it amongst the fuqaha, amongst the scholars. 
Whereas aqeedah la. Aqeedah is what? The aqeedah is qat'i. That's why they say the word aqeedah. Aqtu shay'i, it is to connect something to your heart. Aqdan jaziman. Sahih? It's to connect something to your heart. That's where the word aqeedah comes from. It's a knot. Aqeedah linguistically means the word aqah. That means to knot something. Rabd. Is that you've knotted this in your heart so strong. You've got an aqd in your heart. Fiqh like illa. Fiqh is what? Ilm and it's dhan. There's knowledge involved, which is clear cut, as I said, which is qat'iyan. Ka wujub salawat al khams. And there is what? Dhan me. Such as what? Ka wujub salati al khusuf. So we said it means word for word. So the definition of fiqh technically means what? Ma'rifa. Ma'rifa of what? Al ahkam. Knowing the ahkam. The ahkam means what? What does the word hukum linguistically mean? What does the word hukum linguistically mean? It means al manu is to prevent. Yeah? Does anyone know the line of poetry that we read? The line of poetry. When we were studying in Al-Waraqat, we took it. It's very important that you go over your notes that you took before. The word where the poet said, Ahkimu sufaha'akum. Go and withhold your dim-witted ones. Ahkimu ama. The word hukum is to withhold. Huh? That's why they call it the hakama, the dabba, the riding beast, the hakama, the thing that's put in his mouth. They, it's called the hakam. To, to prevent it from running and going. That is what it means linguistically, the word hukum. Are you with me? So linguistically, when you say that the word hukum, that's what it means. So how can, how does that work? Is it really realistic? Are you with me? It mean, also some, uh, it means that when the ruling is made, what happens? Somebody is being prevented from something and somebody's been allowed, correct? That's why the linguistic meaning means it like that. 